So hi there and welcome to a special edition of Music Allies uh, TV show where we welcome Jeff Taylor, Chief Executive of the BPI to talk to us. Hi Jeff. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, pleasure. Uh, now, uh, in this special edition of the show, uh, we're building on uh, what you may have read on Music Allies in-depth reporting on the ongoing UK parliamentary inquiry into the economics of music streaming. Um, and if you have followed the story, you'll have seen Jeff amongst many other people being grilled. And Jeff, you know, it's, you're always grilled uh, in, in these terms by the MPs in the inquiry. Um, now, uh, Jeff, just a bit of explanation of, of, of your role. You're the chief executive of the BPI, Brit Awards and Mercury Prize, and you've been uh, in that role since 2007, I think. Um, and your role at the BPI is broad ranging. You can correct me if I'm wrong at any point, uh, but uh, your role includes devising and implementing strategy for the BPI as the voice of UK record labels and the Brit Awards, representing the UK uh, record industry in the media and uh, working and lobbying at senior levels of UK government and, and EU institutions, which brings us sort of neatly uh, to the UK and parliamentary in inquiry, which is why you were there. Um, now, at its heart, this inquiry is airing some complex ideas around how artists, um, songwriters and performers make money in 2021, how royalties should be paid, how label contracts should work, and trying to understand where the value in music sits and what that value is. Um, in what is now a well-established but still relatively new set of music streaming technologies. So as well as Jeff, uh, the inquiry has taken written evidence and spoken answers from a broad cross-section of the industry, including artists and songwriters and their representatives, major labels, publishers and their representatives, uh, plus the big streaming platforms and others. So over the last year, Music Ally has spoken to a number of the key players on all sides of this complicated, multifaceted discussion including here on Music Ally TV, actually, where we, we had nearly a year ago, Tom Gray, founder of the Broken Record Campaign, as well as the European Music Managers Alliance, talking about these kind of things. And um, soon the parliamentary inquiry will publish its findings and recommendations. So we thought this was a really good chance to uh, uh, put some questions to Jeff about how he views uh, the inquiry so far and what he hopes will come out of it, and as well as some questions uh, that we felt were perhaps missing or needed expanding on from his appearance at the, at the inquiry. So we're very grateful for you joining us, Jeff. Uh, and uh, well, let's start with some sort of a general overview. How do you think the inquiry has gone so far? And what do you think the key moments and discussion points have been when you look at it in, in total? I think, it's, I think it's been a positive uh, opportunity for some of these sort of much debated issues to get aired and, and to hear viewpoints from, from right across the industry. So I, I think getting that all out into the open, having a slightly more uh, lengthy debates has been a good thing. Um, I do think gradually there's a, a slightly better understanding emerging of the operation of the streaming market. I think perhaps early on, there was only one perspective and as they've gone through the different sessions, you know, one's starting to get a slightly more rounded view um, I still think that there are areas perhaps which aren't fully understood uh, about the streaming business. Um, yeah. And, you know, that does give some concerns that unless we can get across uh, a full understanding, perhaps using a bit more data uh, of what the streaming music market looks like, uh, there is some risk that we could have policy interventions that you know, won't work or will be uh, counterintuitive or, or actually do more harm than good. So, you know, the stakes are quite high in that respect, and it's really important that we present a fully rounded picture of how the market works. Are there any specific key concerns that you've got in terms of, I mean, we'll talk, we're going to talk in a minute about some of the sort of the, the key aspects, but when you talk about, you know, there's, there's a possibility for policy, policy implementation that could make big changes. What, what, are there some sort of key ones that you, you, you're viewing happening, the patterns through the inquiry? Well, I guess, you know, right from the beginning, um, we started off with some artist sessions where there was a lot of emphasis put on equitable remuneration as, a, as the solution uh, for what was posed as the problems with streaming. And I think, you know, our view would be that firstly, there needs to be a much more complex understanding of streaming and that actually the initial uh, descriptions of how it's working or rather not working yeah. didn't present the full picture. Uh, but secondly, that the, the suggestion that equitable remuneration might be the solution uh, really uh, doesn't work uh, for us. We think that it's not gonna work as a solution, even for those artists who, who think it might but that it also would have substantial negative effects on the long-term competitiveness of the UK business. 
So well, we are quite concerned about that. I'm sure it's something we'll go into a bit later. Yeah, well, we're going to dig into that uh, okay. shortly in, in great detail. Um, but uh, I guess before we get there, perhaps we can clarify one more thing uh, which sort of sets us up for that, which is one of the key questions that's been presented to everybody who's appeared um, in front of the, uh, the, uh, the inquiry, uh, and there's not really been a, a consensus on this, is what is a stream? Is it a sale? Is it a rental? Or is it something completely new that is not covered by those? And in that case, how do we get towards a proper legal definition that serves everyone well? Well, I think you've heard in the last few sessions from quite a few of the witnesses that they don't necessarily think that it's helpful to try and analyze this question using kind of old concepts like a sale or a, a license or a rental or whatever. Those are concepts from the old world and trying to pigeonhole streaming into those doesn't necessarily work that well. Um, what we'd say is, you know, a stream is a stream, but you know, what is it really? So if you look at what's happened to the market, you, know, you can see that the market has shifted enormously over the last 10 years. So if you go back to about 2009, it was a billion pound business in the UK, of which about 70% of the money came from CDs. And you skip forward 10 years, 2019, it's about a billion pound business again, we've recovered, uh, and about 70% of the money is coming from streaming. So what clearly had happened is that, you know, the, the in terms of the economics of the business, streaming has largely supplanted the CD business. And so, you know, that's the, that's the kind of reality. Uh, and that's the reality that consumers are engaging with. Now, the next thing is that when you look at the sort of legal definition, which you've, you've referred to, um, the framers of the internet treaties, who wrote the treaties in the late 1990s, now they clearly understood the interactivity, so the interactive consumption of digital tracks was going to replace the sale of physical goods. And they got that, and that's why they granted exclusive making available rights into the treaties for interactive transmissions. Um, and those were equivalent to the exclusive rights that had existed for reproduction and distribution. So they understood that on-demand consumption was going to replace the sale of a CD and they granted equivalent rights uh, to cover that so that the industry could fund itself, could invest uh, in new artists, could create new releases and market them to consumers. And it, it kind of makes sense because people make these analogies to radio, which, do, which don't really work in my view. When you're on a streaming service, it's not like listening to the radio because you, the consumer, choose exactly what song you want to listen to and when you want to listen to it. A bit in the same way as you chose what CD you wanted to buy. <laughs> Whereas on the radio, someone else is choosing those songs for you. And I know people will often say, well, there are parts of the service like Spotify radio, which should be considered as radio. That's, that doesn't really look at the whole service because the difference, the fundamental difference between Spotify radio and traditional radio is that on Spotify radio, at any point, you are in control. You still have 60 million tracks you can choose from. You can skip at any time. You can rewind, you can pause. You can see the next tracks that are coming. You're in total control, interactive control of that experience. You might choose to lean back, but you're paying a subscription that gives you the option at any point to consume fully on demand. So we think yeah, the, the, the framers of the treaties were right. They understood that this inter interactivity that, that was coming along into the digital marketplace would supplant sales. And as such, uh, that you know, it should, if it's close to anything, it's closer to a sale than it is to, to radio or anything like that. Right, so closer to a sale. I mean, this, this, this idea of what a stream is, is really fundamental, isn't it? I mean, we'll dig into the, uh, the, the how those streams are presented in a second. But people, I mean, I'm talking in a sort of industry sense, but also in terms of users, they're still, it feels like they're still not exactly sure what a stream means, you know, and in terms of, uh, you know, it's clearly not, a, it's, it's not like going to the shop and buying a record as we did 20 years ago, but it is also, it's, it's something you select. Do you think that we are getting closer to a sort of a broad consensus of what a stream means, whether that's culturally or in terms of in, in these more sort of legal terms? I think consumers you know, are very comfortable with the streaming model. I mean, that, that's clear from its, from its rapid growth. Everybody understands the value proposition and there is amazing value for money to have you know, 60 million tracks for, for 10 pounds a month. So I think people have adapted very fast to that. And we've seen, you know, what's quite interesting is that look at the growth of the vinyl market. So you see that 
vinyl and streaming are very complementary. Downloads and streaming, not so complementary, because people don't see the point in storing a file on their computer anymore when they have access to it from, a, you know, from the cloud or from a service like Spotify. But they do potentially want to collect and own at the same time. So, you know, I think streaming has found its, uh, its place in the music economy. And the fact that it can potentially coexist with ownership and box sets and things like that is great and is helping to deliver growth uh, for the whole business. But like I say, I, I think trying to use those old concepts to analyze what a stream is doesn't make sense. Streaming has been the replacement for sales. It's closer to sales than anything else, but let's just deal with it as a stream and a making available. Okay. Um, let, let's move on to um, equitable remuneration. Uh, which for simplicity's sake, I'm going to refer to as ER from now on, um, because I'm going to trip over it otherwise. Now, th this is a concept which has cropped up repeatedly through the inquiry and seems to be one thing the committee is looking uh, favorably on, or at least is focusing a significant amount of attention on as, as we move towards the end phase of the inquiry. Now, a quick explainer, um, in terms of what ER is and how it exists in the UK already. It's the system used to pay royalties from broadcast usage of music uh, with collect the Collecting Society PPL, for instance, splits them 50-50 between labels and artists um, in certain use cases from broadcast usage. Now, the argument that's been presented here, Jeff, is that, you know, what is, well, streaming is possibly replacing radio over the next decade. I mean, it's, it's one of Spotify's stated aims is to you know, take a, a step into that area and some but not all the streams the argument goes are radio like in the way they are served to the listener and then the argument is well then if we use er as, as, a, as a device to divide up revenue there uh, it makes a difference what's your view on i mean you've touched on this already but can you expand yeah. on that and what you feel about that well i guess the, the first thing to say is that you know people like to uh, say that radio is dead and spotify's killed it um, that isn't the case. Uh, actually, if you look at the revenues coming into the music industry from broadcast and from radio, they're going up. Uh, and they've kept on going up despite the growth of streaming. So it's far from clear, this idea that, uh, you know, that Spotify has killed the radio. It's still, uh, you know, a thriving business. Um, but in terms of taking that model, that broadcast model and applying it to streaming, so applying equitable remuneration to streaming, we think it would have really serious adverse consequences for the whole music ecosystem um, that would be very significant and very negative. Um, really what it would deliver is a win, a massive win and a windfall to the platforms at the cost of everyone in the music community. Because what you look at when you see equitable remuneration systems anywhere in the world, what they're characterized by is it's a different kind of right. You've got exclusive rights over here and you've got equitable remuneration rights over there. And exclusive rights give you the power in a negotiation to say, no, I'm walking away from this deal. You can't have my music. Once you're in the world of an equitable remuneration right, you've lost that power. And the user, the platform, can use your music and you can't say no. And all you can do is argue about the price. And that makes a fundamental difference to the deals that get done. So if you look around the world at the deals done under ER systems, typically they, they deliver only a few percent of revenues as the royalty. And that's the case in the UK. If you look at the UK, for example, uh, all the music rights holders, so if you uh, artists and labels who are licensed um, through PPL, uh, they get just a few percent of total broadcast revenues. And so if you compare the total amounts, we make labels and artists together a total of 85 million pounds a year from broadcasting. Now compare that to over 700 million pounds a year that we make from streaming. So why would we want to swap the direct licensing model that delivers you know, seven times as much uh, to why would we want to change that to an equitable remuneration model that everywhere we see it in the world delivers, you know, very small amounts of revenue. And if you look at it on a per listener basis, so if you consider how much value is generated by one listener to Capital Radio compared to one listen on Spotify, uh, we earn about 20 times as much from streaming uses as we do from broadcast. So what it would do is massively reduce the pool of money available to the music industry. Yes, that would then be split through the collecting society. 
50-50, but we're absolutely convinced that artists will be worse off. And not only that, labels will be left with a tiny fraction of the current amount that they have to invest into talent. So you'd have only a much smaller amount to sign new artists, a much smaller amount to market those artists. It would make the UK extremely uncompetitive if this were done in the UK and not elsewhere. So talent wouldn't want to sign here. It truly would be, you know, kind of the death knell for the success of the British music industry. And we can't afford to do that with a streaming model, which every year is delivering growth for artists and for labels. It, I mean, it's, it, so, so put bluntly, that uh, equitable remuneration would, would reduce the, the amount of, number, uh, of money going in uh, from, from the UK to, 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 um, to that part of the industry. Now, it's important to, yes, substantially. So it, it's important to note, I mean, one, in, on this argument, they are not, obviously, you acknowledge they're not saying that it should be applied across the board, but it should be for streams that are sort of radio-like. Um, you mentioned this, you touched on this at the start, those served by playlists, algorithms, you know, autoplay after you finish listening to an album. Like, if you like that, you might like this. So that more sort of passive lean back listening, I think it's, to it to a, to an observer, there is a sort of radio-like quality to that, isn't it? That they're not choosing the songs, they're being delivered to them. And so how do you well I, I don't difference? really agree with that joe you know as i was saying before i think there's a big difference between uh listening to a radio and having absolutely no influence and having not having the ability to have any influence on what is played to you that is very different to sitting on spotify where at any moment if you don't like the song you just skip to the next one or you can skip down the playlist you can see all the songs that are coming you can choose to go to a different playlist or at any point you can just sw swap over and listen to any song in the world that you want to listen to. That's what you're paying for. You're paying your subscription fee for the ability to do those things. That doesn't mean that if you don't exercise that ability, that then it becomes something else. You know, you pay your gym subscription every month. You may go or you may not go, but you pay it because you're paying for the ability to go to the gym. So in the same way, you're paying for the ability to control the service when you want to control the service, or if you want someone to curate for you, then you're paying for that as well. And I think, it's a mistake to try and divide, divide it up into those two parts. But also, it's far from clear that it would actually solve the problem that people have articulated. So, you know, where, how do ER systems work? Well, they're still based on popularity. So you, you get a sum of money and it's distributed by the collecting society uh, to the artist community based on still popularity. So you would still see the large amounts go to the big stars, do a lip and a cheer and would do very well. Uh, people who don't have much, uh, you know, in, in the way of airplay, or <laughs> that, that, that's the word they would use, I would not, but people who aren't being streamed very much, essentially, are going to get a much smaller proportion of that. And actually, you spread it more widely, because potentially, uh, you know, have a larger number of musicians benefiting, not just signed artists. So the money would have to go further. And you'd have to build this very, very, you know, complex administrative system through a collecting society. You'd have to crunch all that data on top of all the royalty distribution that happens through the label networks. So to us, it's not clear that it's actually going to solve the problem. It would involve, you know, a load more administration. And is it actually going to help those artists uh, who people are concerned about? So we think it's the wrong solution. And it also doesn't fit because this truly isn't radio. And a, a final question on, on, on equitable remuneration. This, this, the, the argument against it, like, as you said, is it would lead to a smaller pie of money uh, because cl collecting societies can't negotiate in the same ways that, that labels can. You know, um, Tom Gray of the Broken Record campaign, who appeared in the, I think, the first round of the inquiry and appeared on this show as well in the past, recently suggested there could be a halfway house and it's to, to, to find a way that works for, for both parties, which we sort of touched on a bit, following the publishing's model of half performing right and half mechanical to balance out these negotiating or the perceived negotiating issues. Is there a path of compromise between ER and no ER? Um, firstly, I think once again, trying to take something, you know, an old concept and, and conceptual framework from the publishing world uh, of mechanical rights and performing rights and splitting. To me, it doesn't make any sense trying to apply it uh, to the streaming world and on the side of artists and labels. Um, so I, I don't really get that thought process. Mm -hmm. um, as to whether uh, there's some kind of compromise, 
I don't really think so. I think, I think you know, the current system is delivering a lot of benefits. So we're seeing that income is rising every year substantially. We've seen kind of seven, eight, ten percent growth over the last few years, which has been really positive from streaming. Every year, more artists benefiting. And there are more artists earning a good income from streaming than has been the case from any format before it. So, you know, if you compare, there are about 1,800 artists, British artists, who are achieving 10 million streams a year. Now, that compares to only about 1,000 who achieved 10,000 record sales back in 2007. So already there's been a 70% increase in the number of artists hitting that milestone. And it's growing every year. I would expect that 1,800 to go up to 2,000, 2,200, 2,500 in only a few years. So we're getting large numbers of artists who are getting significant amounts uh, from streaming, and that's growing all the time. So I don't see that bringing the equitable remuneration model, even in part, is, is part of the solution. We have a model which is not only uh, ensuring that you know, more and more artists are succeeding, but is generating record levels of investment into a and r So £250 million a year being invested uh, every year into new music by, by labels. £150 million a year being invested into marketing. The UK doing really well globally, one in 10 streams around the world coming from a British artist. So we're seeing success and we're seeing that success growing at a macro level. Now that doesn't mean that we don't understand the concerns of some artists who you know, feel they're not benefiting from that success because in relative terms, they may not be being streamed a large amount. But overall, the market is doing well and there are hundreds and thousands of artists who are benefiting from the growth. And I think we, we really are at risk of, of uh, putting that at peril and making the UK much less competitive uh, if we're not very careful about the policies that are applied. Well, let's talk then about those artists who are doing well from streaming, because you know we've we've heard a, a lot, and, and fair enough, from artists who feel like they're not doing well, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But the, like you said, there are artists who are who are having great success on streaming, and, and in, whether that's in terms of number of streams or in terms of money or, or however you want to cut that. Um, and you've mentioned some data there. Are there certain, if you look at that data of the artists who are doing particularly well from streaming, what are, the, are there certain types of artists or genres? of artists who are benefiting the most from the benefits of streaming? I think what we have seen over the last few years is that um, you know, British black artists have done very well. Um, it's hard to tell, you know, to what extent is that connected to the demographics of streaming? To what extent is it just, you know, cultural taste as it changes over time? Um, but, you know, I, th I think when you look at the performance of artists like Heady One, D Block Europe, KSI, Youngblood, eight, you know, uh, I guess uh, uh, Jay Huss, etc. You know, we we had a kind of genre uh, push and and a great new wave of diverse talent that's doing very well on streaming services and generally. But it's not to the exclusion of the other genres. You know, plenty of pop artists are doing very well. Joel Corey, Jerry Cinnamon, Freya Ridings, artists like that doing brilliantly. You know, rock bands too, you know, the 1975, uh, Nothing But Thieves, Bring Me The Horizon, Alt-J, you know, th there are rock bands doing really well. So, you know, electronic bands like Jungle. So it feels to me like it is broadly spread. Artists who really embrace streaming, who are good on social media, uh, who are very active and constantly engaging their fan bases uh, can do brilliantly whatever genre they're in. You know, I think British jazz has done very well, for example, uh, over the last few years and, you know, has, has a, a faithful following on streaming services. So I think um, streaming can be great for new music. Obviously, it doesn't work for, for everyone. One of the characteristics of streaming is its low barriers to entry and the fact that there are so many more artists in the market now, which means obviously not everyone can be in the top few thousand. Yeah, I mean, it's it's becoming clear, isn't it, that, that, that I mean, at the moment, at least, because the demographic of users of, of, of the streaming platforms could change dramatically in the next few years, and I'm sure they will. Um, it, it's becoming clear that, that income in general, the idea of income for artists um, is, uh, for all sorts of reasons, particularly in the last year under coronavirus, is dramatically diversified compared to a perceived duopoly of perhaps, um, you know, of, of streaming income and performing income from maybe even only a year ago. Um, now, as you said, there's certain artists perform really well on, on streaming across genre, but it, perhaps skewing to a certain demographic or certain behavior. Now, one person 
um, who has been mentioned in every session at the inquiry since she appeared in the, in the, the first one is Nadine Shah. Um, and has been used as an example from her testimony, her, or her, her responses has been used as in, in subsequent ones. Now, I'm not asking you to necessarily address her situation uh, directly, um, but she's an example of an artist who, you know, it's, I think we're all in agreement, makes great music, is critically acclaimed, um, and is, is, is a great artist, you know, uh, but whose streaming numbers as, as, and she said this, and, and she, her streaming numbers and streaming income alone can't sustain her career. So there are artists who are doing, uh, as you mentioned, huge numbers on streaming, but can we address this part? That if we're moving into a streaming dominated world in terms of that kind of consumption, what does the industry do to ensure that Nadine and artists like Nadine survive and thrive because they're vital, aren't they? Yeah, I'm a fan of Nadine Shah. I, I love Holiday Destination. You remember she was Mercury nominated. We were on the Mercury Prize. I was thrilled. I was kind of uh, definitely um, sort of cheering her on. And uh, she's a very talented artist. Um, there are lots of artists who have different profiles. So some artists have a really strong uh, streaming fan base. Others will have a great live following and sell some physical, but not be as popular on streaming. Uh, you know, that is just the reality of, of the market. And as I said earlier, streaming has also brought a lot more artists into play. So if you look at the number of artists who get 100,000 streams a year, you know, that's about 300,000 artists now in the UK. And if you compare that to the number of artists who used to sell 100 CDs a year, you know, it was about one sixth as many. So we've seen six times, six fold increase in the number of artists in the market. So inevitably, you know, there's still only 100 places in the top 100 or 200 places in the top 200. You know, inevitably, you can only have a certain number who are going to go on to sort of extraordinary success. And so you do see some artists for whom streaming is only part of their sort of music career and part of their music solution. And I guess, you know, Nadine potentially is, in, is one of those artists with, you know, critical acclaim, a good live following, um, but actually, I think her streaming number is something like, you know, one to two million, that kind of range. And the artists who are achieving lots of success are getting tens or hundreds of millions. I mean, there are 300 British artists getting over 100 million streams a year. So those numbers are absolutely huge. Now, for, for an artist who's selling one to two million uh, or streaming one to two million streams a year on, on, on streaming services, that's like selling kind of 1500 CDs. And at, at no stage, of our industry, would that really have earned you enough money on its own uh, to be a living? Um, and I think it's really important that that's understood, but streaming isn't the only source of income. So, you know, for artists um, with that kind of profile, potentially they'll be selling physical records, they'll be selling merchandise you know, in normal times, and let's pray they come back extremely quickly. They'd be performing live and earning a good uh, earning from that. And then potentially things like brand deals and TV and radio income. So there are all these different sources of income uh, for an artist and streaming might only have been a relatively small part of it. So I think we feel that perhaps the, the inquiry got off, you know, to, to a start from a perspective which wasn't really representative of the market as it now is, you know, with hundreds and thousands of artists getting tens or hundreds of millions of streams, there is loads of positive news out there about streaming. But of course, there will be some artists, you know, for whom streaming is a much smaller component uh, of what they do, and who may feel that, that it's not working for them. That's always been the case that there are artists, you know, who, who, who aren't necessarily at the top of the market. And I think if you're streaming one to two million streams a year, you know, you're about six thousandth on the list of most streamed artists in the UK. And, and I think it's perhaps unrealistic to necessarily expect that, that streaming on its own is going to deliver a living at that level of popularity. So you also think, Joe, what can the industry do mm. to help in those situations? I mean, the first thing is all those other income streams that we talked about. But in terms of income from streaming, the thing that can be done that will help more than anything is to bring more money into the streaming economy. So that there's more money to be distributed to all artists. And you know, we have a bunch of policy rec recommendations that we've made to the inquiry that maybe we'll come on to later that we think could achieve that. But there's only so much that one could do by redistributing through equitable remuneration or, or whatever other system, uh, kind of redistributing the plumbing 
and the way the money is distributed can only achieve so much. What is needed is to increase the value of streaming for everyone. And if we do that, that will certainly help artists like Nadine, as well as lots of other artists who aren't necessarily at the top of the tree. We'll, we'll talk in a second um, about the plumbing, as you, as, you, as you put it, in terms of um, another way that has been suggested of, uh, of moving money around, which is uh, user-centric payments. But yeah. on that topic of, you know, you ha obviously have a, a remit and desire to bring in more money. Um, what, what are those ways that you would you, you are sort of discussing of doing that. How can, how can the industry on this, this side bring in more money to, for the good of the industry as a whole, but also that can be beneficial for artists that are of the, of, of, like Nadine Shah, who is saying, well, you know, streaming is not giving me the income I, I would like. Sure. Well, there are a number of things that have to be fixed at a policy level, and there are certain things that, you know, we can work on ourselves. So at a policy level, you know, two things that we've identified. Firstly, there are some platforms who pay a lot less uh, for their streams because we would say they undervalue music uh, because they are able to, to rely on safe harbors. And that's something that has been spoken about quite a lot in front of the committee. Um, the second thing is we have a continuing big problem with piracy and stream ripping has, has exploded over the last few years. Um, that's costing the industry about £200 million a year that should be coming in to be distributed to the artist community and shared with artists. So, you know, more action from government to allow us to better tackle piracy uh, would make a big, uh, a big impact on the value of the, stream, the legitimate streaming economy. The third thing which is very important is the global scope. Of streaming and I talked about the fact that you know already there are 300 British artists who are achieving 100 million streams a year the global opportunity is enormous for British artists typically on average they achieve about four times as many streams outside the UK as they do inside the UK and um, I, I mentioned that figure earlier that one in ten streams around the world is from a UK artist so we have a huge opportunity to grow our exports they've already increased from about 200 million pounds a year to about 500 million pounds a year we published a report recently showing that they could more than double to over a billion pounds a year by 2030 if we do the right things so there's a huge exports opportunity if we promote our music overseas that's tied up with a partnership with government with the music exports growth scheme and obviously you know with the issues arising at brexit uh, which the industry's talked about a lot so boosting exports is something that that we can absolutely do um, but really it's all about growing the pie if we can increase the value of the streaming economy then all artists will benefit and uh, i mean those that's a very clear sort of set of uh, of ways to hopefully bring in some more money for those artists I mean, this is very difficult, perhaps uh, not on a specific basis, but for those artists who then are not bringing in the streaming money, how, how does growing the pie spe sort of specifically help them in terms of supporting their careers? I'm, I'm just thinking, well, think they, they, this is their major concern, isn't it? That if they're not getting money from streaming, wh how do they, where is that support, whether it's through processes or money or what? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, ultimately, you know, record labels share the money that comes into them from the streaming platforms with their with the artists who are being streamed and we talked about how that is all really dependent on on popularity i mean there are lots of ways in which you know the industry sort of helps other people uh, so you know you'll be aware of the hardship funds that the bpi helped to to uh, administer and coordinate um, at the beginning of, of the pandemic um, and we do a lot of funding things like music education courses and you know all sorts of other things. So money is sort of shared around the music community in other ways. But ultimately, I think you know artists who aren't earning from streaming want to be able to earn themselves from other sources. And really, live is the massive missing piece of that jigsaw at the moment. So we've been lobbying very hard you know, with all our friends around the UK music table uh, that government should do more. Uh, to prioritise the reopening of venues in a safe way, but particularly to put in place a reinsurance scheme to make it easier for promoters to put gigs on this summer. And we think that's really important because ultimately, you know, not every artist necessarily is going to uh, earn huge amounts from streaming, but live and, uh, and physical sales, etc., uh, can be a very important part of their portfolio. And let, let's hop over to user-centric payments then, which is sure. a, a, another thing which cropped up I think in, I think in almost every single um, uh, section of the inquiry, it was interesting to see Sp Spotify, Apple Music, and Amazon Music say essentially we're open to discussions on this. Um, studies 
well, the, the, the studies that we have seen on user-centric payments, and it's, it's difficult to, to access a lot of data on this, but there are some good studies, suggest it doesn't move the needle too much in terms of changing individual streaming income. But it, to some people, it, it sounds like, it feels like a fairer system. I know if I'm streaming this artist, this bit of money that it costs for me to listen to, it goes directly to the rights holders around this, this, this song. What's, what's your view on the user-centric payment system? I think it, it's very interesting. Certainly to some people, intuitively, it just feels fairer. Um, I, I've got some questions about it. I, I think um, we don't really understand properly yet what its effects would be. You know, speaking f uh, for BPI, I mean, we've got over 400 independent members, all kinds of businesses across all kinds of different genres. It's pretty difficult to, to say, you know, is it going to hurt one? Is it going to help another? Um, we don't really know the full genre impact. It does look like classical and folk and some other genres might benefit a bit more than some others. Could it be a disadvantage for, you know, for, for grime and hip hop? And, you know, that's been suggested. That's not necessarily a good thing. We'd have to weigh all those different impacts, which I don't think we properly understand. Um, we also, if you're a record label, you don't even know between the different artists on your roster who it's going to help, who it's going to hurt. And you don't know how much it's going to help those who, you know, may benefit, whether it's just going to be a few pounds a year or actually something significant. What we do know is there'd be quite a lot of administration because you have to then look at what every user streamed mm. and do complex calculations at a user level. Um, but that's not necessarily impossible. So I think our view would be we should look at it in more detail. I think BPI would be absolutely open, uh, you know, to getting involved in doing that. Uh, it would have some kind of redistributive effect. If that can be positive, then great. Um, I think we probably just don't quite understand it well enough. And we ha what we haven't really been able to do is understand the costs of putting it in place versus the benefits and whether all the additional systems and administration would just, you know, would make sense in light of how much good it would do. Yeah, I mean, like you say, there's not a lot of data um because for instance there is a there has been some studies in in france which are limited but interesting and um we will you know perhaps some more data will come through if other places will help that happen is there an opportunity here for the uk to sort of take a lead in in, in this sort of global market and say well let's try and get a pilot running and share data and and get everyone involved it, it, you've said that you might be open to looking into it what are the barriers to trying this out I think that, you know, there is some complexity uh, to putting in place uh, either, you know, the systems to do it or, frankly, a detailed study. Um, so, you know, you, you'd have to have quite a lot of partners willing to join in. But I think we, you know, we'd absolutely be open minded to it. I think a study would be the right next move um, so that we can understand it better. I mean, you know, th there, there are some sort of questions in my mind as to um, one of the one of the points that's come up in the inquiry is understanding royalties. And I think it would be slightly um, perhaps counterintuitive in its effects in the sense that royalties would probably get harder to understand because one month a stream might be worth 10 pounds because someone forgot to stream and you know literally hit play once. Uh, and then the next month they might be worth a fraction of a penny because they were streaming all the time. And I, I think that's gonna take some explanation. Um, and would require some work to make that clear. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's one of the ideas that's come out of these discussions, which, you know, a lot of people are looking at and saying, maybe we should learn more about that. Yeah, it, it does feel like there's a sort of a, a, a bit of a groundswell, at least as, as uh, to typical users, perhaps, as they learn that their money does not go directly to the people that they stream, that the people who pay in the first place to access the, the, the streaming platforms, there might be a bit of a grand sort of people saying, well, let's try this out because it sounds better. And, we, and there's only one way to find out, right? So uh, watch this space, hopefully. Uh, let's see. Now, one other thing that has been a, um, a topic which has cropped up, uh, again, in every uh, hearing across the, uh, the inquiry has been, uh, and I'm using air quotes here, bad label deals. Um, and this is where the waters get a little bit muddied because obviously some, when we talk about income for artists, some artists res res receive uh, money almost directly from streaming platforms and uh, others receive it via complicated deals with, be it with a label or whoever um but, but let's talk about label deals for a moment it, it feels like there's two aspects 
there's there's deals from the pre-streaming era era which are still governing how artists earn from streaming now and then the range of modern deals um that have been struck since streaming so first of all what's your sort of view on the state of play of what artist label deals look like in 2021 in relation to streaming well i guess my my view i think has been reflected by the other witnesses which is yeah it's never been more competitive than it is right now um which is good news for artists and managers so you, know, you see that you have the full choice from you can do your if you want a big advance and lots of investment you can do a traditional uh you know style deal with with those elements to it uh, and maybe get you know a royalty rate that's 20 something percent or you can do a, a jv or profit share deal 50 50 and agree you know agree on the marketing budgets and everything's together and share the profits or you can do a label services deal and maybe keep 70 percent of the money or you can do a distribution deal and keep 80 percent of the money or you can be your own record label self-release and keep 100 percent of the money and you've got every choice and you know, managers are aware of that and they shop around different record labels and look at all the different options. And depending on what stage you're at in your career, one or other of those might make more sense. I mean, frankly, we still see a lot of people opting for the traditional record deal. Why? Because getting a big advance and a huge investment into your recording costs and marketing can be a great thing at a certain stage of, you, of your career. So, you know, all those options are out there. And I think uh, it's super competitive between the majors and all the indies and, you know, disruptors like Cobalt and I was talking to BMG this morning and, you know, they're very active in this space. And so it, it is extremely competitive. And I think that's very good news uh, for artists. And I don't really think anyone should uh, complain really about the operation of the current streaming market because artists have every choice uh, if they want to distribute themselves and keep 100% of the money and employ a team to market themselves and you know pay for their own recordings, etc. That option's there. AJ Tracy's done it. You know other artists are doing it, and um, you know I think that competition is a good thing for the business. Did you think in that sense then it's it's one of the sort of the best times to be an artist in that sense because you can you, know, you say you can choose from a shopping list of sort of every different type of deal you want. You, you can, but, you know, obviously it's still hyper competitive out there. So getting heard, you know, you can get your music distributed, you can keep all the money, but you've still got to get heard. And breaking through that noise of, as I said, hundreds of thousands of artists on these streaming services who, who are getting streamed, uh, you know, uh, even in significant numbers, that is a big challenge. And that's where you're going to need a team behind you. And you can either get a record label to be that team or you can build your own team. And, and I think that choice really is a good thing and the market has become more competitive and there are no gatekeepers anymore uh so you know it's uh, in that sense i think it's a great time uh, to be an artist but obviously there are challenges in getting yourself heard and, and establishing a career you obviously talk to labels all the time and uh, just about this what what's their feeling in this kind of hyper competitive market are they are they pleased with it or or how do they feel about I, it i think they've adapted a lot joe you know uh, it, Whichever type of label you talk to, I mean, the majors uh, are doing distribution deals. The majors, are, uh, you know, I think Universal's got Spin Up, for example, which you know allows artists to self-release. So they're all competing in all these different aspects of the market. And depending on the artist's concerns, you know, I was talking to BMG earlier, and they do some deals that are more like a traditional record deal, and they do some very innovative deals as well, depending on the artist and what the artist wants. And so. You know, I, I think labels probably do regard it as innovative. I think it's put a lot of pressure on label margins, particularly where these are short-term license deals. You know, the, the money can be very, very tight and it can be tough for a label to, to, to take that risk of investing a lot up front when the returns can be quite narrow. Uh, so that's one of the challenges for the label sector, but um, there's certainly no lack of competition. Yeah. Uh, what about this idea then that some artists are struggling in, 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 in this side of the argument because they have older deals that were struck pre-streaming and, and don't reflect the nature of how mo income is generated in, in the modern streaming world. Um, how what do you feel about that? Well, I, I think it's been quite interesting that when, when that subject has come up, um, actually a few myths have been knocked down. So, in the major session and in some of the other sessions, we've heard, you know, it, it put that, for example, 
uh, physical breakage is still charged on streaming and you know deductions for old shellac discs are still applied to streaming and actually it turns out that's no longer the case and it's it was suggested that digital breakage uh, so minimum guarantees or advances that aren't recouped uh, in deals between labels and streaming services that those aren't shared with artists and in fact all the majors have confirmed that they share them and then you know uh, equity stakes for example were discussed and, and shareholdings in Spotify etc and the labels have all confirmed that they'll share those uh, with artists so I, I think some of those old grievances have been knocked down I think still uh, you know one hears uh, of uh, a general concern that there may be old deals um, with whatever provisions that, that, that are thought not to be up to date. My view on that is they are and should be uh, individually renegotiated. So yeah, managers generally are pretty adept at renegotiating uh, you know, uh, whenever they can. Um, and that probably is the right way of dealing with these things because every deal is different. Uh, you can't just kind of take one provision and say that one needs updating without looking at the rest of them. Um, so I think that that is getting done. Deals are getting updated uh, by labels. And, you know, a lot of work has already been done in that respect. Yeah. Um, in the indie session at the inquiry, the beggars representative um, said Martin Mills had tried to persuade major labels to write off, and this is related to what you're talking about in terms of renegotiation, uh, had uh, tried to persuade the major labels to write off unrecouped artist debts from the past so that those artists can start earning again from streams, but that they had refused to do that. Um, what are the arguments against that kind of policy? I think the main point is that if an artist is unrecouped, that essentially means that at that point in time, they haven't been sold or consumed enough that they would have earned that amount of money under their contract had they not been paid in advance, had they just been paid a royalty. So what you're really saying is if, if you take a, an approach to write off unrecouped balances at a certain kind of arbitrary point, um, you're saying that there will be more cases in which a project will be loss making for the label or that they will be harder for them to recoup their investment um, because you'll have written off the unrecouped balance and at that point they'll be sharing royalties with the artist and it'll take them longer to get back to break even potentially. So I suppose what we need to think about is if, if that were done in some kind of arbitrary way, uh, is that going to be good for the UK? Um, it's firstly, it, it's you know rather uh, incompatible with contractual freedom and contractual certainty, where you know you negotiate a deal and you, you think you should be able to stick with that deal. Um, that's something which you know when when it's then suggested that you should take one provision like the recruitment provisions and arbitrarily change them across the board. I think that sets a difficult, a difficult precedent, but also potentially it could make the UK less competitive if it, were, if it were done across the board. So I welcome labels looking at it on an individual basis, seeing if it's something they can do. And it's a competitive parameter in the market. So certain labels will say, you know, as part of our offer, uh, we'll write off unrecouped balances after whatever period and if they do that then you know they can attract more artists to sign to them that will help uh, their reputation in the market etc so it, i i see this as very much a judgment that individual labels have to make based on their own contracts and on their own finances i mean just to expand on that i mean it's it's definitely you know it's a complicated issue isn't it and you know as are any contracts bmg for instance have Sort of well, actually, Joe, if I could just jump in, I mean, the other thing I should have said is that what I am hearing all the time from labels is that more and more artists are recouping that they never thought would recoup because of streaming. You know, so all these catalogues that were pretty dormant suddenly uh, are enjoying uh, some success on streaming and artists are starting to recoup. And so this is it's also a problem that starts taking care of itself in that sense, that the speed at which or the time period over which um, artists can recoup can get shorter because of the growth from streaming. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly examples of, of artists sort of being slightly bewildered by uh, one of their B-sides from 25 years ago suddenly being plucked uh, out of obscurity and, and, and becoming their top hit on, on uh, streaming platform. I think Pavement is, is one famous example of that. There we go. Um, and it's, it's interesting use of that technology, isn't it? I mean, I was about to say, you know, BMG, one of the industry, one of the companies that are proactively looking back at um, contracts and correcting um, bits that they th don't think are 
are fair anymore, working anymore. So is there a chance? I mean, you know, what we heard in the inquiry is that the major labels in this instance and this piece of um, uh, uh, this answer to this part of the inquiry is they, they weren't keen to do it. Is there, I mean, is there a chance for a little bit of loosening of, of the approach to that and, and being on the front foot? Well, we, we talked earlier about renegotiation, and I think you know this is a parameter that comes into that as well very often. But um, I, I think it's very difficult for the BPI to sort of express one view on a subject like this, because as I said, our member labels, you know, you've got tiny indies for whom it could be financially disastrous. You've got other indies who may not have much catalog uh, for whom it, it, it may not be disastrous and they may be able to do it much more easily than uh, say a small indie who's bought a load of catalog with you know, recruitment provisions that would cost it a lot of money to undo. It could be very different for a major again with a deep catalog. So I, I think it's, um, it is a little bit dangerous to try and, oversimplify and say there should be you know, one particular rule on recruitment. I think each label's got to look at their own position, but certainly the BPI favours labels looking at uh, their contracts, keeping them up to date, having a constant dialogue with artists on their roster and their managers, uh, and individually renegotiating where it's appropriate to do so. I mean, on, on that point, before we wrap up, I mean, you're, you know, Jeff, you're a nice guy. You must, you, you care about music and everything that's going on. I mean, do, do, do you, you, from an empathetic perspective, you know, you, Art, there's a there's a tranche of artists who are saying, look, I feel frustrated here. I mean, what's your sort of sort of feeling about that? You know, the, it, it's 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 a shame, isn't it, that we've got our sort of key creatives in the space feeling frustrated. I think anyone who comes into this business, you know, I've been in this business a long time. I'm in the business because you know I was a musician as a kid, and you know, music's been my whole life. So. All of us in the music community and everyone I know in a label wants artists to succeed and doesn't want artists to feel that streaming is working for them. What we've tried to bring to the inquiry is perhaps an understanding that there are a lot of artists in the streaming market. I mean, many, many thousands. And of course, it's just unavoidable that, that a certain percentage of those artists are going to feel like they're not earning much money from streaming because, you know, they're can only be so so many artists perhaps who are f far enough up the list of streaming that their streaming will earn them a significant amount. And that is based on how much money comes into the streaming business. If we can double the amount of money into the streaming business, then we double the amount all those artists are receiving. So for us, you know, that's a really key element. And we want to see artists earning as much as possible because you know, we want a creative flourishing in the UK. We want as many people as possible with talent to be able to enjoy a creative career and be a musician and entertain us all and grow the music business. You know, that's absolutely what we want to see. What we're worried about is that some of the suggestions for intervention that are being made would do more harm than good, would actually reduce the size of the UK music business, would make it less competitive than other countries. And I talked about the exports opportunity earlier. And we are in an absolute battle for people's attention around the world on streaming services and on social media. And if we don't do more to promote British artists than other countries are doing for their artists, then we will lose market share. Um, those in our income will not increase as streaming grows. So, you know, the recorded music business is, is due to increase from about just over 20 billion to 35, 40 billion by 2030. And the whole question is how much of a share will UK artists get of that? That comes down to how many artists do we sign in the UK? How much do we market UK artists? How much do we promote them? And for that, record labels are absolutely invaluable. So I think the partnership between the label and the artists is where the magic happens. That's what's made the UK so successful. The fact that we invest 250 million pounds a year into a r is what makes the UK so successful. Comparatively, you know, we're the second most successful music nation in the world. I want to preserve that and grow that. And that will benefit, you know, all parts of the community, songwriters, artists, labels, publishers, producers, session musicians, everyone. Uh, and we think those are the right policy prescriptions here. It's those that benefit the whole community, that grow the pie, that will, are really our best way out of those concerns. So, of, of course, we, we absolutely feel empathy for artists who feel they're not earning enough. But we think there's a better way to attack the problem. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you've, you've spoken a lot about the, the need to grow the pie in, in, in this case, and uh, you know, there's lots of ways of doing that. You've mentioned them, of course, with directly with streaming. One way is to grow the, the number of people who are subscribing each month and 
whether you're turning um, free free tier people onto paying ones or people who haven't interacted with it to paying ones. Um, you know what we, what we're sort of talking about here is when we've talked about you know what is a stream you know um what about uh, what are expectations of artists and, and and increasing income there seems to be this theme of um re-understanding if you like what the modern music industry is when it comes around down to streaming and one of those things is the amount that you pay per month you said at the start you know 9.99 a month for, for unlimited like all you can eat streaming is ridiculous value and you know, is there a feeling that maybe that's too good to be true and and do you think there's appetite amongst the public to contribute more to build the pie? Look, I, I think we're still in a phase when the streaming market is growing, and you said it yourself, Joe. You know, the the, the fastest road to growth is getting more people to subscribe, right? So we, you know, we want more people to come in, and we want people to leave the free tiers and go onto the subscription tiers, and getting that market penetration of subscription streaming up as far as we can is a really important part of growth. So I think at a time when you know, lots of people are under economic pressure, um, the streaming services are going to want to be careful about doing anything to, to the retail price. And they're obviously all in a fight to attract as many users as possible, which makes it harder. Yeah. You know, we have seen Netflix increase its prices over time. We, we've seen Spotify, I think in Norway, wasn't it increase its price? Or was it Norway or Finland? I can't remember. And didn't see much in the way of churn. So you know, at a certain point, one, one would hope that the value of a streaming subscription can rise uh, and that consumers will accept that because they can still see it's still tremendous value. I mean, you know, had it risen in, in line with inflation, it would be kind of £12.50 or something like that now. Mm, yeah, more uh, so it has really fallen back. Um, I think that may come, but is constrained by the availability of free streaming services, which pay very little, and by pirate sites, which pay nothing at all. And you know we need to address those challenges if you want to put value into the into the legitimate business. Yeah. So let, let's 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 wrap up then. I mean, what? But perhaps this is the biggest question of all. You know, what happens next? What What are your hopes for the committee's recommendations and in the report that they're going to publish at some point soon? I do hope that the committee will absorb the uh, you know the points we've been making about all the positive growth there is in the streaming business and value that growth and value the trajectory that we're on and see that that trajectory will deliver for more and more artists over time if we can keep it up. You know, our, our hope is that they're thoughtful, I'm sure they will be in their policy recommendations and not do things which will make the UK less competitive or undermine investment by labels, which is really the engine uh, of the UK music market's success. You know, Labels partnering with artists is where it's at, and we need to keep that environment dynamic, competitive in the UK. We shouldn't over-regulate it or ossify it or make it you know, too centralised and bureaucratic. I think you, what you want is lots and lots of competition between lots of different labels to sign the best talent, lots of competition between labels to sign the best deals with DSPs and get one over on each other in those deals, because more competition will ultimately lead to more investment, more choice for consumers, uh, and more options for artists. And, and are you hopeful about the, the, the report? That it's it's gonna, I mean, they've, they've been very thorough in one wrong respect. They've spoken to lots of sectors of the of the industry. Do you, do you, do you feel that there's gonna be a solution that will, will, will please everybody in that sense? Um, I think it's too early to say, I think what has really come across is that there's a lot of complexity here and that you know this is a very dynamic complex marketplace with many different uh you know competing elements and that generally speaking i think um letting that market operate letting that process of competition decide where value flows letting popularity guide us <laughs> as to where money should flow uh, and letting the market operate is a really important part of our success so I, I would like to see the UK, um, you know, not over-regulated. Uh, and so I guess we would hope the committee will think carefully about those things. And, you know, there are recommendations like those that would grow the value of the streaming economy or UCPS that a lot of people seem, you know, interested in that I think could be positive potentially for the whole music community. There are others that I think have the risk of really damaging the value of our music industry. And so I, I'm very concerned about that. And, you know, we'll, we'll have to see where the committee ends up. And, and very finally then, um, you know, 
you're obviously passionate about music. We all are. We're involved in the industry, and there's a lot of uh, and where you get passion, you get um, extreme reactions. And we've seen, for instance, on some well, all sides of the debate, really very strong feelings. And it, it's sort of it's well, it depends how much you uh, care about following Twitter drama. But there's been a lot of, sort of uh, very uh, let's say heated uh, discussions. I've seen a few. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and you may have been on the receiving end of a few of them. Uh, I've been imagine. on the receiving end of a few. Okay, yeah. um, uh, but I mean, is there an opportunity here, perhaps, to to, to get to get labels sitting down, get everyone sitting down? You know, maybe I'm being too altruistic here, but is there is there a, a too sort of idealistic? Is there a, a chance to get labels sitting down with people from both sides of the, of, of the argument and in a sort of calm way if you like g g reaching some sort of agreement and saying because if, if, if people are there is a substantial group of people saying we want change and then surely they have to be they can't be left hanging here they, they, they want to see some sort of progress right firstly i i think you know you talked about in a calm way and i think some yeah. calm would be a very good thing um you know personally i regret that uh, I think some of the um, debate has seemed to get so personalized. I think there's been a, a lot of demonization of, you know, I, I know a lot of people who work in record labels and they are, as you said, Joe, they are all people who are passionate in their love of music and only want artists to succeed. And, and when, when you hear representatives of, uh, of you know, former lobbying groups suggesting that the only people who make money from streaming are people in record companies, things like that, Firstly, it's massively untrue. Secondly, it's really unhelpful um, because it's very misleading. Because as, as we've said, you know, during this interview, there are lots of artists who are doing well from streaming. That doesn't mean they all are. And we recognize that. And we recognize that streaming is a challenging environment for, for lots of artists and we all want it to, to generate more value. Uh, but more constructive conversations, as you're suggesting, you know, in a calmer way, would be something uh, that I'd absolutely welcome. Um, I think, unfortunately, uh, you know, I guess uh, certain individuals have seen, you know, this as an opportunity to, to really go to town um, and, and to attack hard. And I think that's they, they believe that's the best way to affect change. Um, I hope that we can come to change. Uh, you know, if, if change comes, that it will be done in a, in a way of partnership and constructively uh, and by the industry together. Um, and, yeah, dialogue would be the first step you know towards that so mm -hmm. certainly the bpi is always always open to such conversations yeah. i mean as you say it's an ultra, ultra competitive market and perhaps you you could have some sort of empathy for for those people on that side going in hard because perhaps it's what they feel they have you know um but you, it would be you think you think there might be a possibility then at least to, to initiate some sort of open dialogue you know i i think the bpi is always open to talk um yeah. you know we hope that uh that those we're talking to understand that we represent a broad church of, of different kinds of label and we try to find a way through that's good for the whole sector and, and generally speaking the, the things which benefit the communities as a whole are those which really advance the ball i think um and, and so more focus on on those solutions and you know there are other ideas that we're working with other partners around the uk music table on like a music production tax credit you know the film industry the tv industry have tax credits that increase investment into new talent there. There should absolutely be the same thing for music. So we're working out proposals to go to the treasury uh, on, on that front you know, with our partner organizations. That is a constructive step to try and get more money into the music business and have it distributed you know, down the chain. So um, there are you know, ideas for things we can do together and, and we're always absolutely open to those. Okay. Well, it, I mean, it's going to be a fascinating uh, period now as we sort of move towards the end of the inquiry and, and, and see what actually comes out of it. Um, and I think, uh, you know, what it, it's, it's clear, as you said, it's, it's an incredibly complicated and a, a complex machine that we're, we're um, sort of uh, investigating here, if you like, putting, putting our fingers into this machine and seeing what happens. And I, I, you know, we, 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 this one's going to run on a little bit, isn't it, I think. And, uh, but, but there is a, would you agree that there's a general feeling of change of some sort is happening whether it's you know it, it's increasing money coming in or clarifying what different things are in the industry and and, and or even on a human level understanding each other's roles and needs you, there is that there is that feeling of change in the air isn't there i think certainly you know the exchange of views has actually got into more depth than, than ever before which is probably a good thing and and i hope that has increased uh, some understanding 
and could lead to a better dialogue in future. This is a business that is changing incredibly fast anyway. You know, you look at, for example, the influence of TikTok and how that's come out of virtually nowhere, you know, in the last few years. And so there's always a new network coming, a new social media platform coming along that's shaking up the business and you know, new opportunities. And for example, you know, the money that's now being earned from virtual gigs. Uh, as a result of the pandemic, yeah, that's a real, really new, innovative space that's going to transform the music industry uh, over time and generate new income for artists and potentially for for labels and songwriters and everyone else. So, you know, there are always those new opportunities, and that's what I get most excited about. I think sometimes the debate about you know you've done this wrong, you've done that wrong in the past is a bit sterile. Um, I'm much more interested in what we can do together in the future and growing the business and you know that's where we think the opportunities really lie okay well a good, good place to leave it then let's see what happens so uh, jeff taylor of the bpi thank you very much for for joining us here on music on uh, tv uh hopefully i'll we'll, uh, we'll have you on again soon perhaps when the dust has settled a little bit in the future and we can see where things are going then a real pleasure well thanks for having me jeff a pleasure, good pleasure. Yeah, good, good to have you here. Okay, so that's it from this uh, special edition of Music Ally TV. Uh, as ever, um, you can follow us on the social platforms. Links are below this video, and uh, you can click. Uh, there's a link below to our weekly uh, uh, newsletter, the knowledge, uh, and as well a link to our subscriber services. So that's it. So from uh, Jeff Taylor and me, Joe Sparrow, here in Berlin. Thanks very much. See you soon. Thanks.